Welcome to Stories from the Standing Room. Join us for tales of history, phantoms, folklore, ghost stories, mysterious happenings, and more. A playful and fun weekly podcast with a British husband and his American wife. Join us from inside our 450-year-old home in the English countryside. The journeys into the past, the arcane, and the downright spooky. Welcome, everybody, to ah. episode seven of Stories from the Standing Room. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Ann Kelly, and this is my husband, Chris. <laughs> Christopher Grokut <laughs> and Ann Kelly Grokut. Um, we are doing uh, the audio uh, is going to be going out. It's, it's now a podcast. We're really working on everything with you, our live yeah, audience. It's that multi-platform oh. experimentation that we're working on. Yeah, some of you have been with us since the very beginning. It's yeah. kind of painful. Remember when we were holding it up to our face? Oh, yeah, it was we're moving dorks. everywhere. We're dorks. Know, we showed we're you getting, around the room. We're beginning to get somewhere. So now we have so, a little bit of structure. A little bit of structure. L- a lot of bit of structure, hopefully, and uh, more ghost stories coming in, uh, more presence on Twitter. Uh, you can find us at Stories from the Standing Room, or actually The Standing Room, HRH on Twitter, or just type in Stories from the Standing Room. And you can also find us on Facebook at Stories from the Standing Room. Um, and... Our website is under construction. It is actually in pre-production. Yeah. So right now we are kind of handicapped. We are having to use Facebook as our foothold yeah. uh, right now. So we're using Anne Kelly's friends and family. And thank God for them. Thank God, husband. Thank God that you go. Yes, because we, we need to be able to engage with you. You kind of hold us accountable having a live audience. Because there are other podcasts out there. And we want to give major props. Does that translate? Props. Uh, give props to somebody. Uh, mm. Kudos. Uh, Nobody like, doesn't. Uh, nothing okay. So if you say, if you know there's somebody that you want to say, hey, well done. Oh, okay. What would you say to that person? Would you say, hey, "Hey, well done. (laughs) Cheeky, cheeky, uh, cheeky happiness. Or how would you say that? What would you say to them? Okay. Hey, well well done. Oh, (laughs) hey, well done. Well done to the other podcasters out there doing all of the uh, paranormal podcasts. There are a schload. Does that translate of them? Uh, Shitload. No. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> there's, <doesn't> is, <laughs> there's a ton of them. And ours is really, uh, we want to say we're certainly not competing. We are joining in with all these amazing paranormal, otherworldly Absolutely. podcasts. And we are focusing on history, hauntings, horror, folklore, facts, and then some. So, And one quick note to you watching live. We oh. do apologize for, we know you, you, you're writing comments, but while we're doing this, we can't see them because of the nature of I recording. I kind of can see them, but I think I probably so should I, I think yeah. it is kind of, we do apologize that we, we can't respond to your comments. You're probably saying we can't hear you or whatever, so we do Yeah, apologize. last week they started telling us we were sideways we're, from the very um, beginning. Do you know what we did last week? We manned up and did the entire thing. and had to, Yes, right afterwards, which is really kind of a professional way. I thought we were very professional. I was yeah. sweating. and we I just, couldn't remember what I'd said, though. You I did great. I didn't you know did if I'd said it High five, husband. Second. Well done. Right, well we done. Um, okay, uh, so we want to uh, say thank you to all of the new uh, folks that have joined us over on Sound. Cloud. We have uh, many more subscribers this week, which is pretty fantastic. We are stories from the standing room there. We are also stories from the standing room on Pinterest. And what have I left out? iTunes. iTunes. We're also on YouTube. Oh, you know what? If you could, please, we really need subscribers. People to subscribe onto yes. YouTube. Please go and subscribe onto YouTube. Please. We need some subscribers. Please. Please, please. We have it's nine. early days yeah. and we need a few more. Yeah, so what we're doing is we're really just gaining our momentum and really learning uh, tech stuff and just crashing and burning as we go along the way. But today... Oh, I think we just, just grow. I don't burning. think we're crashing and I don't think we're burning. We're just, You're not, just learning yeah, as we go. Last week last was a crash week the, and the, the, the mic wasn't issue, but ha, I think... Not it's... only did we reshoot it twice, but then the, ne- the next time we did shoot it, one of the mics was out. So literally last week's audio was just... So apologies about that Just one. went to poop, just went to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. Seriously, there's nothing I can do to fix it. So today, we welcome you to episode seven of Stories from the Standing Room. Husband? Plague and Pestilence. Plague and Pestilence. Or the pestilence. Great Pestilence, as the it was known. The Great Pestilence. There were several... Or sometimes the Great Sickness, too. Yes, there was, there was actually... there was the, the, You have the plagues of ancient Egypt. Plague plague really just means an incessant... Uh, uh, viral, be, probably more... A viral, a viral-based illness. It can be Plague well, of Locusts, though. So well, that's it can, not, yeah. yeah so. But I think usually when people are talking about health, it's just a viral-based... Yes. 
An incessant awfulness. Yeah, How's just, that? Just stupid. Like sometimes you say, I can plague you by teasing you so yeah. much. Yeah? Well, yeah, that is true. I get, do get plagued quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a plague as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a great plague. That's a, yeah, probably. Yeah, Husband, a, we can do another episode degree. of that. Of the first yeah. It's all right, because that's what wives but do. But okay. plague we are. Okay, please explain to America, because we're only, uh, you know, we're on our 200s over there. Young. We're like teens. And and no, there has been AIDS has come through and things like that. But there, well, yeah, explain I mean, what, what I, I, would I, like I, to have waves. I, I think we need to let's okay. Let's yes. put, let's put the plague into context. I'll put the plague. Thank you. Let's put. We we've had three major bubonic plagues. Okay. Uh, we've had what we had. There was one in five forty two. Right. And that took out probably half of Europe's population. Each time it's taken out about half Somebody of Somebody loves that. <laughs> taken out Europe's, yes. half of Europe's population. So we had one in 542, one in 1348, and one in 1665. So it's a reoccurrence. But what, but there's been, there was always plague. It was one of those illnesses that was always there. But what would happen is there would be a mutation and the mutation would take hold and it, that would actually push the numbers up. So there are always outbreaks of plague. It was one of the facts of life. Just It just happened. You just kind of hoped it didn't happen. And yeah. you heard the stories of the horror of it happening as well because you were mentioning what it was like. I would like for you to translate for the American audience well, if you yeah, would, let, what it would be like for that magnitude. Okay, let, 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 let's, put it into, let's put it into contemporary sort of context. If you imagine it's it's um, April and someone is on a long haul flight arriving at a small LAX LAX say. okay any any US airport it really doesn't yeah. matter from Europe yeah no oh. just long haul let's okay. it's a long haul a passenger arrives on a long haul flight into any US airport okay that passenger is taken ill on the flight he's locked up to by fellow passengers mm. by the crew when he arrives he's taken to hospital. Well, right, he's taken to a hotel, then he's taken to a hospital. So certain people are having contact with him on the plane and on arrival. Okay. Ah, I see so, where you're going. Yes, okay. Yes. That's May. Okay. By the time we've got to October, mm -hmm. and the weather begins to change and gets colder, um, the population of the US would be would have reduced from it's about 300 i think about 300 million mm -hmm. there will be 150 million dead dead and how and how long of a span is that from three months? April, april to october so just half a year you've got uh, 150 but, yep. million go but ahead you so say you can't bury your dead nope you have no the, the armed services have collapsed the police have collapsed there's no crop production there's no hospitals medicine education or family units are broken right. up too, yeah. because parents will move away from children, children will move away from parents. The whole nature of society has collapsed. Not only the support structures, but the, the kind of moral, emotional structures that we take for granted, like families, that would have broken up too. So not only are there, are there, is no, there's no food, there's no stores. There's no doctors you can call, there's, there's no, no hospital you can go to. The army's broken down. Yep. There's just ba maybe bands of people just trying to survive. And there's also bands of people taking advantage of those that yeah. are falling. And also, yeah. you, you've got way too many people to bury. Yes, and you can't keep up with that, so what do you do? Well, you just, I mean, it, it depends on how many is taken out in the city. But if, if, if you think that maybe, I mean, let's say 70, maybe even up to set in, in urban areas, you could get 75%, 80%. If you think 80% of the population of Los Angeles dies mm. in several weeks, yes. you can't bury them. And people know that you can't bury. You will have death pits. The, the military will try to intervene, but the military will then begin to die at a faster rate because they're dealing with the, with the corpses. What I'm trying to think of is a movie that's been done like that. I think The Stand, I don't know if they covered things. They usually turn into zombies. They don't ever have yeah, to they, worry about they burying do, Yeah, them, they do don't they? need to bury about, about burying because because burying is one of the, the one of the issues. Yeah, and, that's a huge problem. Yeah, it's huge. So to, to think of the horror of this, and one of the things is one of the, the the whole aspects about the stories we'll be telling tonight, and about the ghost stories are about the burial places mm -hmm. rather than the places. There are a couple of ghost stories which are about the places where people died. Yes, but most of them are about the places where people were buried. So. Um, these were great death pits because when the play would start, for the first few, they would have been buried normally. But after then, they were buried in 
pits, great pits with lime and soil. And it was just literally like a, a, a vision that you'd see maybe from the concentration camp, that kind of large hall with heaps and heaps of bodies. I hate to say this, but it's a lot like a lasagna. It is. It's layer and then but lime was, and then layer and then lime and then there layer. There was a description very similar to that which came from Italy at the time and they described it as the type of lasagna. So that is, that, that's exactly as it was. It yeah. was just layering the bodies. Um, and interestingly, the, the, before the, the plague spread from China, and it was probably because of the Mongolian invasion of Euroasia, it was probably bought that way because it opened up routes which weren't previously open. Right. So that the strain that hit in uh, 1348 moved through through the Silk Road, through the Mongolian path into Europe. Mm. So it's, it's what we're talking about is Euroasia. We're talking about from the Pacific Ocean in, in Ch of China to the west coast of Ireland. Mm. So it's this great stretch, and of it's the coming planet. over. It's not just the the fleas. It's not just the uh, not just the rodents, not just the humans, but it's literally the disease within all of those. Everything. Yeah, I mean, it, the thing is, the fleas are carrying because they have the sickness too. The rats are carrying it because they have the fleas, but they also have the sickness. The people are carrying it because they have the sickness. Yes. So okay. it, it's, it's 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 this nasty tidal wave, which is almost unstoppable. Right. But they did they did know that the. They knew beforehand because the merchants were able to bring back word and it was able to spread quicker from the, the virus itself. So, for instance, in England, in, um, in I think it was late 1347, because they knew it was already the outbreak had taken Italy and it was beginning to take hold in Italy, the church. I think relatively secretly started to buy plots of land field next to churches because they already realised that it was a far more intelligent uh, uh, society from we, we, we give them credit. They realised that this was going to be a pandemic well, and, so, and they wouldn't be able to bury. So they secretly started to to uh, buy land for the, next for to the churches for burial mass burials. Pits? Yeah, for the mass burials. Yes. So they could still be on consecrated ground? Yes, they, they consecrated the ground and they, they were ready. So the, it, it, it does show the intelligence of medieval society. And, the, and the, I think the same happened when the other plagues had hit. The, 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 first, the first large plague in 542 was, was in the Dark Ages and it was, it was the time where Constantinople was, was rising. That was the, uh, but the rest of the, the Roman Empire collapsed. The, it was, there was, we hadn't got the structures in place. Right. So we don't know very much about that one, apart from it, it hit Europe and Asia very much. But badly. also half of those people, or 80% of those people are dying out. So you've got people in power, people that are in the Oh church. yeah, I mean, the, the, chop, it's chop, 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 chop. It, 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 it's like the whole society mm -hmm. goes. I mean, the, you probably had a better chance to survive if you were wealthy, because what the wealthy were doing, they realized that actually the more, that to, Con there was some form of contagion. So they were going off to country estates and not mm. and basically barricading themselves in, which is the most sensible thing and you could do. And just growing their, their stuff. Yeah, they were just, just, it didn't matter. You just, at that point, you well, would just Well, they would think that it came food. in by, by air. Could yeah, be... the, the miasma. Yes, miasma. So Please explain miasma the, the, the word miasma is basically foul or, or polluted or evil air. Mm. And what they thought, they under, they didn't understand what cre what spread the plague. Mm -hmm. and they didn't have the understanding of viruses that we now, now know. Mm. So there were, there were lots of different potential ideas of what, but the, 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 ma the major aspect was we thought it was foul or evil air. Yes. And, can't you understand why? Because if you think if you've got that many dead, before, you knew when you were getting close to a town, a village or a city, Whew. because the larger it was, the greater the smell and the, the, the further away you'd smell you it. Can you imagine London? Because you could smell death. You I imagine think, what that would be yeah, like. On the, the wind of death. Whew. So if you, were, if you were getting near to London or Milan or Paris, those large uh, urban conurbations, Yes. Which the plague loved because everyone was close together. I mean, it hit the, the, the villages and the countryside too, but the plague loved. The, it was because of the time when we saw a great expansion of urban life. And this is what really propelled Well, it would it. probably make it really yeah, easy for it to do its thing. Yeah, people were close together. They, they lived yes. and worked and, and were eating together and trading. So it was, it, it, the, the quickness actually happened far greater because of the fact that the new, the new, the new urban lifestyle that was taking hold. In Our Europe. town that we live in has about 8,000 people and approximately 88%, correct? 
yeah, that's of what our I, yeah. town was wiped out in the last plague, which and would the be last the 16, plague in 1665. 1665. So can you imagine 88% of your town just going within a yeah. matter of weeks? Yeah. And then, then you had, what, there's no structure, there's no yeah. nothing. And, and yeah. in a way, what, that's that why if you look at the town that we live in now, yeah. You can't really see much evidence of much growth in, until the last couple of years. Mm. The structure still remains the same, and it shows that the part was depopulated. Yes, that's true. I mean, there were new windows and things put in, but most of the houses are up to that date, and that point is when you got So our up. windows that we're sitting in right now, this room, actually, they would look out these yeah. same frames at and the time of probably, that play. I mean, this, 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 would have been, this would have been a, this, yeah, this would have probably been a bedroom. So there's more from a 50% chance that people died of plague in this room. Right where we're filming. Well, they probably had a bed there, so they probably died here. So it was probably Maybe. there. Maybe. So the scratching you heard on the wall might have been them. Whoever who opens knows? the doors, who knows? Who knows? Um, and also, when we go around to the different churches, you can also show these bumps. And yeah, you the talk bumps about these are the, yeah, you often these are the plague pits. Yeah, you often yeah. see You often see when you enter a churchyard, you will often see the ground will rise in at least one place, maybe several places. And this is literally the death pits. Even though the bodies have um, decomposed, they will, sit, they will still great mounds right. of, of bodies. So yep. they, they're not that high now, but you can certainly see the rises of churchyard. Yeah. They just threw dirt the over them and they didn't know what else yeah, to do. The, the death pits were there. So we were going to talk about the, as the plague came through that last sweep in the 1660s through London, which was yeah. massive, the plague pits of London and the new cross rail that's coming through, yeah. uh, which is actually snaking its way uh, for those in the States who don't, we're not really yeah, savvy the, with the, underground the transportation. Underground, the London underground system, which is the largest in the world, goes all over the place. And the, so the tunnels cut all over the place. Now, when the Victorians were building, they tried to keep around and move around the death pits. So there is, you do feel, you, you, if, you're, if you know where they are, like Moorgate and Kensington, you do feel the train move quite quickly. Yes, it does. And, it does and that, that is pure, that's not geographical. That's because you're there, they're trying to keep away from the plague pits. But these, these underground tubes really quick, they weren't always these little, obviously modern tubular sh trains. Yeah. They were 1863. They were choo-choo trains. They yeah, had back soot in the 1860s, and coal yeah. and all that. 1860. They'd said the, the Thames Tunnel opened in 1843. Is that true? Yeah. That's crazy. 1843, they were building these huge, massive tunnels underground. And your nose still gets full of black air yeah. from the soot from those trains from so yeah. long ago. So the, from that period. So this, the cross rail, if you want to explain the cross yeah, rail. Cross rail is, is a new is a new rail system. It's, it's an underground rail system. It sits alongside the, the existing underground or tube system in London. And it goes from east to west. But it's cutting through the heart of the old city in the west. And it's huge. If um, you imagine a big truck, a huge massive lorry, a big massive Mack truck, what we yeah, would call in the yep. States, sideways, turning like a big drill. If it's, it's sideways, just, yeah, it's, it's just, literally that many feet across this yeah. huge massive hole. And it is, it's drilling straight through. But where, where there are certain spots, they are also drilling shafts down. And, and when they, they, these shafts have sometimes hit plague pits, yeah. they've hit it uh, in, um, in Clerkenwell, and also um, Liverpool Street Station. Right. The, they, they've hit the plague pits there. And what they've done is, as part of the, before they started doing the building for this new, they've had archeological digs, particularly the one in Liverpool Street. Yes. And they've, uh, they've dug down and before they, they're doing this digging to create the tunnels, they, they've been having archaeological digs of these, these mass burial sites. What did they find? Well, they, they, they're just finding lots and lots of mass burial. But and, are they finding the, the plague still within them? Sometimes they say that that bacteria yeah, can survive. Some of, some, of the, some of the variations of bubonic or mnemonic plague can remain uh, virulent for over 300 years. So you can, in certain circumstances, remain in the soil. So you have to be really careful. So they, they are doing it. And in the 1980s, I had a friend who observed the digging of the far side of this, uh, this burial ground, this mass, mass death pit, which they are now excavating or excavated last year. And she said she saw them moving the bodies out at night in men in white suits. They were bringing like, the... Yeah, bio suits, so it's biohazard yes, suits. Yes. Um, so they weren't taking any precautions. But interestingly, the Liverpool Street um, death pit, that uh, a, a ghost hunter went down 
for want of a better word, and uh, accompanied by a notable uh, woman who's psychic. Yes. And so she was she was uh, sensitive to it, and he described the atmosphere as being very heavy and she she just put her hands up to her face apparently mm. and just went oh my god I do, they don't know what they're releasing here mm. it's not that it's the souls of the dead but the energy related to those bones and and almost like the bones are a recording each one of those bodies has an energy within it associated yeah. to the fear of the death and there's so many together and the the theory which which some people have come up with um, is that potentially this is opening a great psychic whirlpool in London. Oh, that's interesting. Because they're opening the death pits at the same time. Well, you have also you have the fear of the death coming, of the plague coming, because it happened within a week. You were dead within a yeah, week you or were, two. Yeah, it's but seven days was the maximum usually. The loss of the families grieving for that particular person, the sadness surrounding the quickness of these these deaths. There's a lot of sadness around these pits. So yeah, you have the very sadness, much fear. So. You have all of these low vibration energies, loss. Yeah. And and, and then the uh, physical suffering itself of the uh, disease, because it did come on, like you said, quick. It's like flu-like symptoms. Yeah, very, very quick. And, then, and people would, I mean, if you were ill, and you, you would basically throw the food at them and run out the room. And that's what the burials were like, too. You, they would just, they would, the, the burial carts would, that's where the bring out your dead comes from. The burial carts would, go, would co one? go around every night with a bell, and they would just call out down every hey, street, that's handy. bring out your dead. And so that, that's that's all you would hear really it was silent if you can imagine there was no light so it was very dark a dark world and if it was over or urban or rural it was dark yeah, no and there were lamps. just these yeah. these men wearing like masks and wearing as much protective clothing as they could with these great carts yes full of bodies and they would just ring this bell and just call out bring out your dead bring they were the guys dead. taking them to the place yeah pits. and they just take them to the they just have the put the edge mm. literally put the cart to the edge of the pit tip them in and then go back for fill the cart up and that was happening every night i think it was something like about some of those the, the major death pits in cities were taking about 250 bodies a night that's it's just such a massive amount. I don't even think we can get our head around no, that. No, we can't get our head around. There it. have been there have been movies made and books written about that, but never I, about the part about because you never see in movies people having to eat poop or, or bury their dead. <laughs> they just eat don't. Poop. Who's don't not poop? eat poop. Eat comma poop because um, you just usually in in zombie movies you don't see people. Sometimes you see them opening a can of beans or something. The people that are surviving, yeah. but they're not doing the things that you normally would have yeah. to do. You like do, burying you do people. have to survive, and you do have to and try pooping. and bury people yep. um, so the, the, the people were just and it, as I say it just broke up the whole family unit it just like things just people were also entombed in their houses because as soon as the, the people were society was so scared it was desperate to survive mm -hmm. it was a pop it was truly apocalyptic yes and as soon as there was plague on the house that house was sealed it was but you were boarded into the house no food coming in no food going out nope. no water going in no and water there was going a red you were boarded into the mm -hmm. house there was a red cross painted on the door and it was a plague house you couldn't and there's a ghost story in york uh, which comes from the uh, second plague in thir of 1348 yeah uh, of a little girl and the story that what happened is the little girl is seen crying on the bed and there's one of the surviving medieval windows in the first on the, on the first floor. why is she crying uh was because she, she was entombed in the house because her parents had plague oh, and she God. was um she was resilient to the virus but they didn't know people could be resilient she, they just thought and they she literally starved to death inside the house with her parent oh, rotting oh my god and the the, the ghost story is it's mm. a very haunted house and they will nearly uh, it, it's very common to hear the little girl crying Lesser and there were heart. there have been periods in history i think the last one was in the 70s yeah. when she was seen sitting on beds crying in, in the bedroom upstairs well as you would because they wouldn't be had they wouldn't have time to investigate and see what's up they just know plague close yeah, the doors it was and nail them shut yeah and you, you, um, i mean the, the, who would investigate who could go out because no one they're just, all dying you're just trying to survive so there is this creepy ghost story of the little girl in york who cries and so she's still because there because she was yeah. entombed in entombed yeah. in her dead which would parents. be which is a horrific i mean it there's is, been a lot of really horror in humanity. horrific yes it is a very it is truly a horrific story. story tons of suffering we don't really appreciate how good we have it in the western world in 2016. Yeah. But we never Jeez. know it's around the corner. No, a pandemic can come at any time. That's and true. 
that's that's, that's true. Thing. So we need to appreciate things the are fragile. Yes, very. And speaking of that, we were going to tell um, our podcast today. We were going to talk about your survival down in one of these tombs. Oh, that's and kind of that. That yeah. is interesting. Yeah. I've forgotten that that aspect. Yeah. Um, we were talking about the tube cutting through burial grounds and St Pancras churchyard was uh, I think the largest churchyard in Lung London and it did have some death pits from the plague but it also had a lot it had like almost a thousand years of burial and there were potentially I, I can't remember how many but it was well over a hundred thousand it was into hundreds of thousands of bodies which had built up over a thousand years and it's massive and then in when they built the tube um put the underground system in in the 19th century they they put the, the 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 one of the lines and one of the escalators going down to the tube lines straight through the death pit and they built the, they built the ticket hall straight through straight are surrounded by the, the death pits. How far down? Really quick. At London streets, how far down are the two? Yeah, some of them. Then this goes very, this, yeah, very, very deep. The deepest in the world. So, yeah, um, they are very deep. Very it deep. takes forever to get down there, but we don't know how. But the, the tube, the tube, uh, the ticket office is just beneath the surface. So that's just at the level of the plague yeah. pit. And then the. And that would make sense. In 1980. It's a good seven, story. Yeah, Listen, in 1987. Listen. I was working on, uh, on some film or something. I was doing some design work in London and I had to change at King's Cross Station. Um, you had to change your tube. Yeah, I, I, I was going from one line to another line. So I got off the tube and I was going through this, this labyrinth of underground tunnels, which lead you from one tube line to another because they're all quite close together. And I could smell burning. And I, I did have to also get out at that station to go and get something. But I could smell burning and I went up the escalator and but the, the atmosphere was very, very strange and it felt wrong. It felt really strange and I knew I had to get out there really quickly. It felt like the soil and the, the outside and it was breaking through mm. and it didn't feel so I ran up the escalator. Which is something you normally would never do. No, no. So I ran as far as as, as fast as I could. There was a strange rubbery burning smell and there was a slight smoky in the air. But I thought, I'm not concerned here. They're concrete tunnels. They're me metal escalators. What did you think the smell was? I thought, oh, well, something like just, I don't know. It was a burning Heath Tribe mm -hmm. smell, but I paid no attention. Okay. I ran up the escalators and then um, I got uh, the ticket office really quickly. I went through the platform and I was out. When I came back about an hour later, I knew something was wrong because I could see helicopters mm. and all, the sky was illuminating with like blue flashing lights. Oh I was about God. two streets away yeah. and I thought it's gone wrong. I, that's what I thought. It's gone wrong. I remembered immediately that smell of smoke, mm. Um, mm. but I could see helicopter. I could see several helicopters with searchlights down and I thought I knew there was a lot of blue lights. I'd, and then I turned around the corner and there must there must have been 40 fire engines and hundreds of ambulances. This is a wide road. It's like Oh, it's about eight lanes of traffic it's right in the middle of London. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, it was a parking lot for ambulances and fire engines. And this is King's Cross. This is King's Cross. Going into the entrance of King's yeah. Cross. Yeah. And then out of the entrance to where, the, where I'd come out, the tube station, was, were walking firefighters in white suits. And they were walking out of like a scene of hell, like a blowtorch of white flame, like literally like you've got a blowtorch. And it wasn't my flame coming out. It was like blowtorches coming out of ed, uh, the ground. So it was like a, a hellish Aronimus Bosch. And that, so I'm looking at this this thing thinking, oh, my God. In the tube station. Realising how close I had been to being engulfed by the fire. So how, how what told you to run? I just felt wrong. And it felt like it was all breaking through. Did you go against through. the traffic or were they going It was down? quite quiet. It was, about, mm, it was about half past nine. So it was quite quiet. But I do remember the faces of the people I saw coming down. And they died. They all died. I was the last person to look into their faces. Oh, my God. But so I a couple. Oh so God. the next day there was an emergency number because a lot of people, unfortunately, were killed in this. And I called the emergency number and they said, we need to speak to you. And I'd gone back up to my parents in, in the Midlands, which is about 100 miles away. Mm -hmm. So I went back up. Because I was in, you know, I was in shock because I realised be, yes. uh, it was not only about me, but it was about the faces of the people yes. that I saw coming down. Because I realised was anybody was, else going up with you? 
No, they were. Go I was running past people at and the bottom. They were going down to but, the tube. Yeah, they were coming down. It was like a. It was rather like a surreal movie. They're coming down. Was like, it a bomb? What happened? Uh, it was one of those strange things where where air can actually explode in certain circumstances, and the dust burnt. It's. It, I like a perfect storm? It was a perfect storm that doesn't happen very often, but there was like years and years of dust and things that you wouldn't think were flammable. Mm. And it just created such a heat. And also the, the tube drags air through, hot, warm air. It does and suck so it through, And so it dragged yeah. the oxygen wind, through yeah, and then wind. it created a, 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 a perfect condition for a firestorm. So you went home. I went home and then the next day um, I did, I, I caused, uh, and they said, um, we needed to call Scotland Yard. So I called Scotland Yard and Scotland Yard drove up immediately. I spoke to someone, they put me through immediately to the team who were dealing with it. They were coming up. So they drove up a hundred and something miles immediately and interviewed me. And I do remember that they, they had these sheets and a clipboard and they had faces which they'd taken, which they, they'd um, taken from the CCT Camera. cameras. And there was a picture of me and they just, there was a little box and they just ticked it. Meaning he's alive. I'm alive. Mm. And I had to get, but the, the point is that was something that was also built through one of those pits. Mm. It was? Yeah. So That's that, what, that, it, was, yes. it was surrounded by one of those pits. And I remember at the time, I could never put this into context or, or explain it to anyone, but it felt like it was coming through the walls and it was like, what was through there was reclaiming. And it was a very strange feeling, but it saved my life, being able to be aware of it. You're very sensitive to stuff like that. Yeah. I'm so, very glad that you so turned I, the other way. I, but, the, the, but the police also did say to me, oh, um, we, we, we have seen the TV, uh, CTV. You were wearing a long brown jacket, weren't you? Mm. I went, yeah. They said, what you didn't see, because you didn't look behind, but as you were running up the top of the escalator, there was a fireball coming up behind you. Oh, my God, husband. So, oh my and God. I was told that, that they, they'd seen me and they said, you're the one, yeah, we know you. You're the we, last we, one out then. Yeah, we saw you, the yeah. last one out. How does that make you feel? I don't really have ever really thought about it. That's a really, really I think powerful it's something story. That, I think it's something which I just kind of put to bed. I put to sleep. I put there and don't really consider. Do you know how many people passed away that night? Oh, I think it was like oh, about eight. Was it about in the eight? Somewhere mm. about eighty or ninety. Just going home from work. Just doing. Just going home from work. Going mm. out for a drink. Mm -hmm. Going back to their families. Doing normal stuff. Now, this is where the, the cross rail is now cutting through. This is a, a yeah. much larger yeah, uh, and going through and bigger going through death pits, bigger death pits. And the psychic has said, and, you don't know what you're dealing you with. You don't know what energy. you're. Yeah, I mean, I, I, more of this I don't know what I, I don't know if this could be given uh, uh, a kind of credibility or not. I really don't know. I'm just it's just something I, I'm yeah. aware of. It's interesting. That certain psychic people have said you are this is waking something because it's it's it's, it's creating an alignment across the city of all these different death pits are being opened or uh, all these plague pits are actually being released at the same time. My hair is cut. Sorry, I'm listening. Yeah. Um, well, it, there must be some kind of energy associated with that kind of death and loss. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I don't burial. think it's like soul energy, but there is something about. I mean, everything is energy. The emotions. Yeah, the emotion, their body. Emotions are, yeah. and thoughts. I mean, if you just think their bodies are literally atoms held together by energy, so everything is a form of energy. But they're also so. returning into the earth that surrounds the tombs. Yeah. So uh, there could be memory within those cells. Yeah, there could be memory. We talk be, about stone um, memory, but there's body memory too. Yeah. And the body actually hold a form of memory. So uh, on the end of that story, when you came back, you said you came back to King's Cross and there were the coffins. Oh, yeah, that, that, that was really quick. It was, it was beginning to feel like I was in a movie. It was like, I'm thinking this is not as life is. A week later, I decided I'd got, I spent a couple of days at my parents. I went back home to London and I thought, I've got to go through King's Cross. Oh. It's a major, uh, some of, I mean, the, the, burnt, the burnt areas were closed. Yes. But there was, because it's just a big system and there's it so many tunnels, again, it yeah. had to be open, you closed London down. It was, it's part of one of the major crossroads in London. So I've, I've got to go through, I have to use that station, just get it over and done mm. with. And I got, off, I got off a tube and it's quite quiet and people were still not getting off because they, they were just feeling very awkward about it. But they yeah, were trying the, the to energy get the would still be anything. there from what just happened. So I thought, I've got to face up to my, the, the demons or the, or, um, it's a good way to put it. And so I 
came up and it was a quiet point in the day and I came at one of the entrances which is the entrance that comes straight onto the street. Yes. And I, I was thinking this is feeling really strange because it's really quiet. And normally you as load and load of traffic. Yeah, it's it's London really is busy. Loud, yes. It's loud and it's a really big road outside. It's loud and it's silent. And Completely. I can literally hear the wind. And there's a few people standing in front of me. And as I walk up the steps, directly in front of me is are two fire engines and each of them have a row of coffins on. And I walk straight into the two minute silence for, oh. the, for the firemen who were killed trying oh. to save the people. Oh and I thought God. the timing was so strange. I thought this is part of the matrix of my experience. Yes, uh, nothing happens by accident. And so I walked into the silence and I was presented Mm. by these How many coffins, coffins were on? I can't remember. It was maybe about seven or eight. Was, I think it was on two. I think there were two fire engines. They'd literally put the coffins on the fire engine. So the moment and they silence, had a flag everybody, everybody is quiet. Yeah, and the, the, tra the, tra city, yeah. Yeah, the, the, tra the traffic has stopped outside and there's people there. And oh. it's just the wind. And I'm just walking into this silent It's never world. quiet in London. That's no. a very, very remarkable And I'm just, moment. I'm facing these coffins. And I've got, I haven't got people in front of me. I've just got these coffins and it's just very... I'm really glad you made it out. Oh, it was very, very, very one of those strange events, really. So that's the part of it. We're surrounded by the plague pits. One of the many, many, many. One of many the many, yeah. Pits. And and it was an unexplainable event, and it was just one of those very strange events. And the last one out. Yeah. And the last one out. And your hair long at that time. Yeah. Was it down? I don't know. I can't I remember. remember. I, just, I, I remember the. I remember the people. All I remember really yeah. is running the feeling of entombment almost. If you were to say one one word of the faces coming down, what would you describe? Just daily life. What would you? What would you remember seeing in their eyes? Mm, I blocked it out. Okay. All right. What I don't know. That's I, right. I, honestly, I can't. That's okay. I, I remember there was a man, and then there was a woman, and then there were two men. Yeah. I remember kind of the order. Uh, do you remember their age at all? They were kind okay. of mostly middle aged. They were like office workers. Yeah. Your average office workers going home. I understand. Well, thank you for sharing King's Cross with us. That's a very, very. But that was story. right in the middle of the, uh, the plague pits. Yeah. But plague and pestilence is our theme tonight. Yeah. And we're going to do our tales from the arcane. We want to thank you for submitting your stories. Um, we want to encourage you, please, to submit your stories. We didn't realize how popular wanting stories is, by the mm, way. Yes. Uh, there are twenty thousand ghost uh, podcasts out there that want your stories, but we want your stories too. So if you have tales you'd like to share, like Mr. Birbaum and Joy Galloway and and Red Fox from New York, all those people submit your stories please 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 do uh hit us up thank you for that please hit us up at uh, facebook.com forward slash uh stories from the standing room or you can find us at facebook.com where you're watching uh which is the uh, podcast is watching at uh, facebook.com forward slash ann kelly stories from the standing room we will have our own um email addresses but they're not up yet no so uh please hit us up just drop me a line and uh, we will get it taken care of you can also find us on our youtube channel by making comments on our youtubes Plus, it's not time for that yet. It's not time uh, for that. It okay. smells really good. I just smell okay. good. Okay. Yeah, uh, plague and pestilence is our theme. Um, this is actually submitted from the. Listen to this. Their name is the Ghost Bus Tours. Ooh, do you think driven? Is it like a ghost Ghostbusters. train? Like no, a ghost bus? No, a ghost. This is a brilliant name for a company. We like to give them a plug because they sent the story in. Ghost Bus, like. To yeah. What you call it over here, coach? Yeah. Ghost, ghost bus, bus tours. tours. So Ghostbusters. Yeah, Ghostbusters. See? Uh, Ghostbusters. Oh yeah, I've only See, yeah, 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 I, oh, for I didn't get Ghostbusters. Yeah. Husband, it Ghost is a brilliant, Buster, go, yeah, that's, that's a really very clever. clever. Yeah. Yes. So on the on that alone, they're already awesome. Yeah. But they have submitted a story about the um, the strange occurrences, and I'd like to share that as part of our stories from the arcane. Um, during the late 1900s, strange occurrences were reported during the London Underground. And so, what's the matter? Yeah, 1900 sounds strange, doesn't it? 1990s. Yeah, that's what I mean. It just like it feels like it's another century now. It is another yeah. century. But we like, were born yeah, in it. Yeah, late 1900s feels like it's a century ago. And it's only I know. 18. Oh, it sorry, does. that's what I was looking, thinking. Yeah. It's, it's 1990s. You were it's born like, in the early 1960s. Can you even get your head around that? No, not really. 1960s. That was like when Venice Anyway. Was, oh, okay, sorry. Back to the 1990s. So <sighs> got okay, the, during the late 1990s, strange occurrences were reported inside the London Underground, the tube. These unusual events occurred occurred on a stretch between the Circle Line's Edgware Road and Baker Street. Do you know where that is? 
Yeah. Okay. Don't be reading over my shoulder. No, all right. uh, according to please, according to reports, trains would lose all electrical power and break down in between the two stations, leaving the passengers in complete darkness. The breakdowns were happening so regularly that the operators came to the conclusion that there was a major fault affecting this part of the track. The Circle Line is the world's oldest underground railway, and some of the origins can be traced back to 1863. So it was obvious to electrical engineers that there would be a worn part of the track, obviously, after, yeah, that, many after that many years. that many years. During their investigations, the engineers were unable to diagnose any problems, as the track had been functioning for 120 years without a diagnosable problem. And it started to frustrate the managing team. So they decided to record as much evidence of this particular stretch of track as possible, in the hope that passengers would report clues that they requested if they spotted anything unusual about the breakdowns, anything mm. at all, then they, maybe they could put something together. Yeah. To their disappointment, the management team received limited responses as to what they believed might be the prank letters or reports. Now, when the team requested evidence, they did see uh, noticeable sparks or smoke just before the train broke down. However, what they received was out of the ordinary. Many of the responses from the travelers included cases of paranormal activity. One report stated that a lady who journeyed on the train for 15 years taking the same route had started to notice something inexplicable happening to passengers shortly after the train departed from Baker Street. She claimed that many people suffered from panic attacks or sudden mm. emotional outbursts occurring right there at the same part of the track. Mm. Another report stated that during a lengthy breakdown, the lights would flicker. That would be really scary. Spooky, yeah, yeah. Be, yeah. The, tube, the light goes out in the tube. It is it, it's pitch it black. Pitch black. You can't get blacker than that. You just horrible. can't. During this time, the passengers noticed, listen to this, human-like figures standing outside their carriage, not moving, but just lingering there in the darkness. Brock is here, okay? We have, there were several other reports from different witnesses, all airing sightings of bewildered figures loitering in the dark. Slowly, more and more reports came in of a mystical kind. The management team realized that this was no joke and they needed to investigate it further. Thankfully, due to some Victorian record keepers, evidence, evidence exists of the track dating back to 1863 and this showed that during the production of the tunnel, Diggers had discovered large amounts of teeth and bone fragments, so they named it the Plague Pit Tunnel. Mm, there you go. Astounded by the evidence, the London Underground team requested advice from the British Museum as they were unable to confirm the area between Baker Street and Edgware Road was a plague pit, but it is still thought today that it is the resting place for up to 20,000 bodies in that tiny little stretch. Mm. 20,000 bo human bodies. And in the that. tube is going right through the middle of the heart of the energy. Yeah. You're so not you're, above it, you're surrounded you're by it. You're in it. You're actually going through it. So if you're afraid in a graveyard, you know, think about yeah, it. Well, you're, you're surrounded. Really, it's, you're like, surrounded it's like by, being a room built of bones. It's a tiny space for 20,000 bodies anyway. Yeah. Eventually, the team decided to hire a priest to bless this section of the track and sprinkle it with holy water. Now, the London Underground team encouraged passengers to report any occurrences during their journeys. There have not been any reports of spirituality since the blessing took place. Maybe the unblessed spirits are waiting in the darkness, plotting their revenge from their unsettled resting burial. That's what the ghost bus tours are telling us. Uh, that's um, quite scary, that one, because it's, 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 it's something which I, I can visualise that, that bit. It's a tiny stretch. Yeah, actually, thinking about that, it's a, there are certain stretches of the underground which do have, even though it's all the same kind of, you're dark, you're in a tunnel, you do, I, I'm aware of them feeling a bit more spooky from others. Really? And one of them is also Kensington. Now, Kensington, where Kensington Station, as it sweeps, it turns quite quickly. Yes. Or is it Knightsbridge? It's one of the two. I can't, either Knightsbridge, it's which one? But one of them turns quite quickly, and that turns to miss a plague pit. Yeah. And there are there have been reportings, probably since that tube station was, without, was opened, 100 and whatever years ago, of uh, people say at night, or when it's quiet, they can see figures in the darkness. That's what they were talking about, yeah. And that, that's, all, that's at the Kensington. They were talking about them standing outside the tube yeah. when it's in the dark. That there is are just... photographs of the Kensington one. You can see it does certainly look like 
figures standing where 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 the tube's train would hit them. Phew. There's something that makes it extra scary if it's underground and it's dark. Yeah. Something extra scary about that. There is something really Because there's hauntings in the that. houses, but you're still above ground. If you're below but ground... But when you're in a tunnel, yeah. you're like in the land of the dead somehow. It's, well, it's like literally. Hades. It literally and it figuratively. It goes back to that idea of Hades being sort of the land of the dead under the ground. How about the bath? In the bath, wailing walls of bath? Oh, yeah. What was that? You need to tell us about I see, that I one. lived in bath for a period. And, yeah. And there's a, 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 as a section, it's just in the middle of the city, but as a section of the, the it, medieval wall. For those who don't know about Bath, Bath is not that far away. It is the uh, most incredible uh, um, preserved Roman bath outside yeah. of Jerusalem. Yeah, I think there's two there's two Roman baths which are pre preserved with water in them. Mm. There's one at Bath, which is just up the road, and there's one at Jerusalem. So it was a major Roman spa town really it was, yes. it was a relaxation town it was a place to go and just go to the baths and hang out and they had heated gamble. water they it had was just yeah it was a bit of a, it was, a, it, was, a, it, was a, it was like a uh, like a first century tourist center it was um but so, in, the, in the middle ages the um, the town wall was yep. built around them and just outside the town wall at the time of the plague there was the pit and i think they literally used to throw the bodies over into the pit over the over the wall how do you do that well you just get somebody who's strung and just no one's strong if they get the plague. Yeah, but the, the, the death men were still, and why they were still alive, the, the people with the death cards. You mean they're just putting them over something you don't have to deal with? Yeah. Like over a over a. They, dug, a... they had dug a large pit the other side I of the see. wall. Okay. And the people with the death cards were just throwing the So you don't have to bodies. see what happens, I yeah. guess. Okay, I see. And the I next see. day, they come, somebody would come yeah. with like masks and throw lime on or, or soil or whatever. But these these walls, where they used to do this, is now in the middle, and they've... Mm. It's right against the sidewalk, and it's said that if you watch, people have reported this for, for many years, and also tourists who, who don't know about this, but they, 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 often the police are called because they think someone's fallen over the wall, and oh. they hear moaning, and they say, well, it's like moaning is like one or several people moaning like suffering and the, yes. yeah, and the police don't I don't think the police even bother to uh, go and look now. Really? Cause because know, it's... Yeah, because it's just known as the moaning wall. So what what you're hearing is an audible, uh, a, 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 a voice phenomenon. Yeah, it's a both of, voice phenomenon related to the actual sort of walls. Of crying. Like, yeah, There'd be yeah. a lot of grieving yeah, going the, on I, the that idea, wall. The idea of... Um, we we're talking about the stone tape. Does yes. the stone recording the sound? Yes, very much so. Could be. And but, but yeah, uh, it's too that, bad that we, was a death pit. We don't have smell-o-vision uh, because this smells so good. This reminds me in the old days cloves tell them about this beautiful clove we'll put up a picture yeah. for our podcasters this is literally uh let me physically describe it it is an orange with i'm not sure hundreds of cloves stuck in it it looks almost like a christmas ornament you want yeah. to tell us what it's, this is it's for a pomanda um a pomanda if we go back where i was saying earlier about the miasma that the the plague being spread by bad smells uh mm -hmm. so what people did to try and fight off the plague was they would use uh, rosemary and tamsin and cloves and herbs which had a good smell. Strong. Yeah. Um, just trying to clean the air because of the idea of the evil air. Right. Um, so people used to carry these. But that, that was one idea. But the other idea, it's, it's, it's about the balance of this smell. And this smell is just at the right vibration, as it were, to cut through the smell of death. Because if you're walking through, or just anywhere, if you're just at home in your house, the smell of death, the stench will be overwhelming. Well, it's so actually quite pleasant. It just helps mark, and it, the, so it does, one, it gets rid of a, a very, very nasty smell. But secondly, they thought if you smelt this whilst you were walking, it, it, would, protect cl it you. would clean the air and you wouldn't have the evil air that would give you the plague. So people... Had these, thus, it looked a bit like the doctors. Yeah, the, that's the doctors with the long noses. You see them, they used to wear the leather caps. They had these long, what looked like beaks, because inside those beaks were all of these herbs. Yeah, they put the herbs in. I mean, it, one, it was sensible because they were dealing with a lot of, it, it did smell without having mm -hmm. to go to these houses. But um, 
it they, is. they thought it was a way of protecting them to keep the marasmus away from that the, so they they will not get the plague and thus so, they're called quacks because uh, they look yeah. like ducks they yeah? look like ducks and it was literally it was a stylized thing but the reason it was it was basically like an, an early gas mask yes it's a good idea so yeah, it, it's, it's like it, instead it. of having charcoal and what you now have in gas masks they had these herbs and it was that it was the idea you were breathing through these herbs they had leather boots that went all the way up they had a wax jacket that what they wore over the yeah. top they had a stick to keep people away keep people away yeah. yeah and so but that still wasn't helping and it didn't matter how well, great it, it smelled it just maybe gave because no one knew what it was it was just it did seem like the yeah. end of the world and i was watching a program on on youtube it was really mm -hmm. interesting if anyone wants this link i'm sure i can find the link but it was actually a program it was a science program made in about 1980 or 81 and it was the very it was covering the very early uh, days of um hiv and it was before it, the program was made before uh, there was even the, the, the term HIV. And so different people were calling different things. But at that, what was interesting about this program is different doctors are coming out with quite very wide range of what's causing this mm. infection. They know it's viral, but they don't know. And they don't mm -hmm. know what groups it's hitting or why. Right. And they're saying, well, we can see this group. And they're just beginning to pick up... Um, People that, that are using syringes to inject, so, so they're, uh, they're finding they're finding groups who are actually sort of injecting uh, dr drug-related illnesses, and they're saying, well, it's, it's it's something. It could be something to do with the um, with the what their bodies and what's happening with the, the heroin or whatever they're injecting. But um, it's such. A, it was quite interesting because that actually shows, con well, relatively contemporary doctors kind of coming up with very kind of wi widely different ideas on what this illness. Where the hell was. is this coming from? So and what do we do to stop it? It's easy for us to see plague and yeah. understand what it is because it's been explained to us. But they did the best they could. Yeah, and at seven point four billion. Uh, on the planet, uh, we may be. Who knows? Who we, knows? we don't know. We there's other lots of things that we don't know. Uh, everybody thinks that we've got to the finest, the highest part of science. There's still so there's much. There's always we something don't know. around the corner. Um, did you know that in 2014, there's an island that is about 17 acres wide. In 2014, it has been dubbed the world's most haunted island. I think most things on most haunted are dubbed that. Yeah. It's the most haunted house, the most haunted pub, the most haunted all this. But it's called Provilia. Have you ever heard of Provilia? I've been past it. I've driven past it. <gasps> I've been around it. You have? It's okay. really... I saw it on a misty day in February Ooh. and it was getting quite dark. And it, I didn't know the stories, but I, it just looked weird and spooky and it, I wanted to get away from that place quite quickly. Well, it's mostly abandoned and most of the tourist things will tell you, you can't get there. Yeah, it's if like a lot of reeds local, and rushes. Yeah. It kind of melts into the Adriatic. It's There's a clock tower there that you can't. Did you see yeah, any you, building? You, you, I could see some building. We only kind of scooted it in the boat. But What did they say about it? Did they say anything to you about don't go there? I don't know. It was in Italian. It was in Italian. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, they would have said yeah. something. Please stay away because yeah. in uh, the olden days, it was really like a uh, quarantine. If you had signs mm. of it, you just got on a boat and there you went and they yeah. left you there. Um, so literally over over time, it has been uh, just a dumping ground for plague victims. Yeah. And so it's between Venice and Lido. It's 17, uh, 17 acres. And it sold in 2014. The Italian government needed some cash. So they put it up for sale. No one wants to go to it. And it's got just hundreds of thousands of dead bodies on yeah, there's it. There's not much you can do with it. Do you know how much it sold for? Can you guess? Uh, two lira. <laughs> no, just take a guess. I've got no idea. 2014. This is today's dollars. I've got yeah, no 17 idea. 17 acres in the, Venice, in the Venice Lagoon. I know, but it's like it's marsh and it's covered in bodies and it's spooky. So I, I can't imagine, actually, because... I think a lot of a lot of people wouldn't want to go there. Well, you know what? They would make it a tourist attraction. They're thinking. Yeah, they were the, yeah. the ghosty tour thing. Four hundred thousand pounds. Which is nothing, because that's like half a house. That's in about how much our house would cost, probably. Yeah, and that's a whole island of bodies. Pounds, yeah. No, there's yeah. hundreds of thousands of bodies. Yes, most of the yeah. travel uh, guides say it is uninhabitable. Uh, some visitors do go there. They say it's extremely peaceful because there's no humans there. They say it's very peaceful during. The day. the day. Yes. So maybe if you didn't um, know of its history, it might not be as spooky. I don't know. But did you know that in these plague pits, not just in uh, Provilia, but there's a nearby uh, place called Lazaretto Nuovo, hope I'm saying that right, that when they were digging into the, um, into the plague pits, Back in the in the olden days, mm. you know, you'd have to dig into the plague pit because where else are you going to put the new plague people? Well, yeah, you always dig into the. Bodies, so you dig into yeah. the plague pit, and yeah. guess what you find? 
bodies. bodies, but they've been shrouded. They've been enshrouded. And then they would find these bodies that are covered with a shroud, but around the mouth, there would be blood and the shroud would be eaten away. And that was called a shroud eater. And that's, they thought because the body had, because the gases and the organ swelling and all that, the gases are obviously going to, and the, um, the yeah, uh, acids are going to become, yeah. are going to come out the mouth. And so but the area around the mouth the would be blood and the shroud would be missing. So they thought they were vampires. They're vampires. They thought they were vampires. That's right. So the shroud eaters, isn't that a scary name? Seems really I think scary. it's the name of a band and that, and yeah, nowadays. Well, if it's not, but, it should be. But and is, no, that, is that close to that island? This is not far away. It's also in the Venetian uh, islands in that you know, area. It's called, well, no, 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 wait. They did say, some people say it actually happened uh, on the island uh, that I was just talking about, on Provilia. But I think there's mixed up information because they're yeah, saying uh, the there's. 70s vampire movie in Italian, but it's still quite scary. Set around there, yeah. This is and a, actually about that. There's a guy named Matteo Borini who uh, is a uh, senior academic at the University of Florence, and he explains during ac- epidemics, mass graves were often reopened to bury fresh corpses, mm. and diggers would chance upon older bodies that were bloated with blood seeping out of their mouth, with an inexplainable hole in the shroud used to cover their face. These characteristics were all tied to the decomposition decomp- of the bodies, but mm. they see a fat dead person full of blood with a hole in the shroud they would say this guy's alive he's drinking blood and he is eating his shroud and causing this disease to happen so he can have more to eat that's what they say he's saying yeah okay so modern science will show us that it is the gases coming up through the mouth area but do you know what they would do you know what is the most famous way of making sure a vampire doesn't come back a stake through the Huh? Right. In these particular play pits in the Venetian islands. Yes. Do you know what they used to keep these vampires, the shroud eaters, from coming back? They used a different way of keeping vampires from coming. It's brilliant. And they found some of these bodies in this in this. Uh, decapitation. Good idea. That's a good one. I would think Iron that would work. around the body. I don't know. That's probably, they probably used that too. But in these plague pits, they actually found jammed into the uh, mouth just a really like you take a rock or a brick and just yeah. slam it all the way back in so that oh, the mouth is open and therefore the vampire would starve can't eat any shrouds can't cause any more drama and that mm. is a good vampire killer just in case you need to know see they need to know they do they need, need to, need to know. Do. so you shove a big brick or into a sharp somebody's... rock just so they've actually found um some of these skeletons like yeah. uh, with you the, know with, with their mouths the open rock in. yeah with a rock in because they didn't want them coming back and the stake through the heart that's not good enough because they're still eating the shrouds. Mm-hmm. So we shall leave you with those shroud eaters. I was just going to say also there is something else Why? before we say leave. And it's, I was thinking about the, the sound around those islands. The Adriatic is very particular. And for those of you who've been to Venice, you'll get this one. But it kind of it's kind of a numb sound. I think a weeks ago we were talking about there are certain frequencies. Yes. And I wonder about the, 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 the relationship between the water around the island. Because oh, that's interesting. It, it, it's, it's, it's kind of the sound becomes quite numb. Yes. And I'm wondering if that's triggering the brain too to actually be more scared of this place because there is this sound and is an acoustic created by the Adriatic. Completely surrounded by water. Water has been proven to uh, actually respond to energetic and yeah, uh, emotional frequencies frequency like Dr. Emoto's yeah. remember our rice experiment exactly where it actually can respond to hate and fear and love but in and, this case yeah. it's like it's like a, it's like a soundboard and it creates a frequency which affects the brain maybe so, but it's, it's different theories they're all around water but it just crossed my mind I was just I was just thinking about water as you said that well I think that uh, water is something that we might be able to cover yeah it's in, at some point in, in the future, future because there is something things. very miraculous about it we're mostly made up of water yeah. Even shroud eaters. Even shroud eaters. It's true. And on this island, all right, on this island of Provilia, okay, not only were there all these plague pits, 17 acres, okay, it's perfect to send all your plague victims out there, but in the 1920s, they built an insane asylum mm. out there. I know. And so they left this, this, and this is, uh, this. I suppose it's Those seen alone. as a, a different form of contagion, insanity. Well, yes, but then anything can get you put away oh, anything, in the insane then, asylum. Yeah. Literally, like smelling that clove in, in a yeah. funny way. You're obviously addicted to drugs, so therefore uh, yeah. you need to be sent away. Or if you have, if you have a, a relative that wants to get uh, the hold on your bank account. 
Yes, that's absolutely the truth. So uh, it's so sad. Uh, but in it, it really is absolutely horrific, these houses, these asylums, these mm. institutions. I so much imagine. so that I think we should do insane asylums and institutions next week. Mm. Yes. Not, not good yes. No, it's yeah, not good, but there's a lot of ghost yeah. stories around it. Yeah, a lot there of are a lot of ghost stories, yeah. Um, but on this island of Provelia, this particular insane asylum, in the 1920s, the doctor that was in charge of these patients, again, without much supervision, he's way out there, guess what he did? He was a very sadistic, uh, dark soul. And the things that he did to these people who were not, not all of them were insane. And even if you were insane, you would never deserve this kind of torture and torment. He is said to have thrown himself out of that tower out of either guilt or the ghosts from the the harm and the torture that he caused. So it's, it's suicide. Mm. Uh, and so then ever since then, it was up until the, I think, I don't know, maybe the 60s, 50s, then people just kind of left the island. The island just has a really bad vibe, Hmm. um, but it has been sold for 400,000 pounds and watch out for a brand new water park, perhaps, in the years to come. I don't know. But next week, what do you say? Insane asylums? Insane asylum. Not just insane asylums. How about those, um, uh, uh, um, the ones we talked about, the camps, uh, not the camps, the um, Irish... Uh, places for homes for girls. Yeah, I mean, like often, I mean, society does do that. Society just, yeah. just, just puts people into homes who don't fit the social norm, and that's the usual thing. It's a for some reason you don't fit the norm of what society thinks is acceptable at that time, and that's often one of the, the reasons of so-called insanity. It's really, really, really unfair and extremely horrific. And man's inhumanity to man will be explored next week when we do talk about that. We want yep. to thank all of you for yes, joining thank us. You. Thank you very much. Thank and we've you. tried out our new audio, so thank. Thank you to our um, SoundCloud subscribers. Thank you so much for our iTunes subscribers. If you can, if you're on iTunes, if you can click a little like, that would be really wonderful. If you're able to also subscribe, please, on our YouTube channel. Uh, More subscribers we have, the more we're able to be able to continue to do this. We're hoping to do it every Saturday night. We're still going to use the live. We love you, too. Uh, We're still going to use the live as a live audience, but we're recording the audio now a different way. So we will be recording. We're moving towards August. We will be uploading new episodes on Saturday. Yeah. Um, but for now, we're still going to be live while we figure yeah. things out. Yeah. Is there until, anything else? I say, until next week, may the Lord have mercy upon your humbles and desperate souls. We need one of those bells. Bring yeah, in your dead. Bring out your dead. And bring in your dead. Not in here. <laughs> I wouldn't tempt, <laughs> them in here. They've been in here. the room. There might be a history right. to it. We better be careful. That's true. Yeah, There's the cat, a lot the of power between. The cat was between. already scared about us when we were preparing for this. That's true. He was staring at something in the bathroom. He loves going in the bathroom. I know he me. does. Uh, it's Brock who uses every week who's fallen asleep in front of us yes. so you can't you see him. You tell him what he did. But he loves to go into the bath. And be, as we were preparing for this nice talk, we were talking about the plague. Suddenly he looks up and I'm watching his face and I'm thinking... There's nothing I can see, but he's totally taking his attention. And I can see he's, he's completely like he goes and he's staring into mid space. And I'm thinking, there's nothing I can physically see, but I'm going to watch what he does. Mm-hmm. And then he, I, I saw his, his eyes focus and grab a focus. And then he looked really scared and it was the bathroom. So then he was at the door and he wanted to get out. And that's mm-hmm. not like Brock. No. He's just like, he's just like, like oh, I'm just going to see him. He would do anything you. to be with you. Anything, yeah, he nothing would just, to keep yeah, it Yeah, like you. a dog. He would just sit, he just sits on, on the side of the bath whenever. And he was really scared. And, and that's when we were prepared. We were talking about the plague Plagues, in this house that yeah. probably has had plague in it and he then suddenly started to react very strangely and in a you, way i've never seen him you husband were in a body of water i was in a body of water so on that note we shall leave us alone in this house and they all gonna yeah, go yeah. off somewhere safe <laughs> yeah be thankful you're not here thank you for joining bye us bye we'll everyone. see you next week for another episode of stories from the standing, standing room. room episode eight we love you very take much. care everyone bye bye